Welcome to Circles Alternative Education. We are based on a farm in Essex. Here young people who aren't in mainstream schools get a practical skills based education in many subjects including animal care, cooking, construction, growing plants in the allotment and engineering. With funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we have been rebuilding the 1965 Lambretta scooter. The scooter was in pretty bad state when it arrived at the farm, as it had been set on fire in act of arson. However, we began to work on cleaning it up and figuring out what could be salvaged. As we worked on it, we became increasingly interested in the history of this 50-year-old machine. We began by researching the history of this make of the scooter called Lambretta. In 1922, Ferdinando Innocenti started the steel tubing factory in Milan. In 1945, after the factory had been destroyed in the Second World War, he decided to manufacture a motor scooter as a means of cheap private transport. The first Lambretta scooter was finished in 1947. Unlike the Vespa that came out at a similar time and used a pressed steel frame, the Lambretta was made of steel tubing using the skills and machinery already in the Innocenti factory. In 1958, the first Lambretta LR150 was built. Though it was the same name as R1, it looked a bit different. In 1961, our model of scooter was launched. The LR150 Series 3 was a great piece of 60s design. Slimmer and sleeker, this model became very popular with young people at the time, especially a group that were called the Mods. To find out more about the Mods and this scooter in particular, we set up an interview with someone who knows a lot about both. What are we doing today, Bailey? Uh, we're on the way to London to interview a guy named Eddie Pillar, who's a proper mod and also a founder of Acid Jazz Records. He also has some memories of our scooter when it was last running. My name's Eddie Pillar and I'm a DJ and record producer and broadcaster and I first became a mod in about 1979, in fact I say about, uh, in February 1979, uh, a couple of months after seeing a band called Jam, who were a punk band that became a mod band. By June I bought myself a scooter. The mod scene goes back to the late 1950s, probably 1958. And there were young British kids that used to listen to bebop, which was a kind of an American jazz. And then in the kind of late 50s, the Italians invented this kind of bike, which was a little bit like a car. It wasn't a motorbike, but it was a lot smaller, and it was kind of had kind of protection around it. It was kind of built, you know, it kept the clothes clean, uh, there were no moving parts or anything like that. And, um, they were called scooters and they were a third of the price of the cheapest car you could get. So obviously working class kids who, who had jobs, rubbish jobs that didn't pay a lot of money, they, um, they bought scooters to get from A to B and it gave them independence. They didn't have to get the bus, they couldn't afford taxis or anything like that. So it gave this generation of kids in the late 50s and early 60s, it gave them their freedom. And scooters really caught on with the mod scene because of the way that the bikes are built, you know, they're built with the leg shields and the mud guards and the, and the side panels, so they're very clean. And the whole thing about mods were they used to wear smart clothes and um, used to take a lot of time about their appearance. And so scooters were perfect; they didn't get dirty. You know, the whole mod thing was about Italian style, not just the scooters, but the clothes that Italians wore were very, very uh, cool, and they were seen examples of European fashion in uh, French and Italian movies from the early 1960s, you know, and they were very, very specifically designed short, short cut suits in interesting colours. Up to that point, men had either worn suits in black or grey, and suddenly, as the 60s started, uh, fashion designers like John Stephen in Carnaby Street started making suits in different colours. I know it's hard to believe now, but Kids were getting suits in brown even, you know. I mean, it was, a, it was a radical thing at the time. So, you know, mods embraced Italian tailoring. Also, on the front cover of the jazz albums that they were buying from America, these import albums which showed black men wearing Ivy League clothes, which were the clothes pioneered by the very expensive white universities on the East Coast, like in Harvard. Um, and these clothes were adopted by black jazz musicians who looked super cool. 
and British kids were seeing these clothes on the front cover of albums. So they were going out and buying them. Okay, as I said to you before, mods started in the 50s and 60s, but by 1975 and the 76, 77 punks had come along and there weren't any mods anymore, they'd all disappeared. And then suddenly, you had this band called The Jam and uh, they were mods. And so kids started seeing The Jam and wanting to be mods. And then these kids started forming their own bands and then kids saw the new bands and they formed bands and within a year you had thousands and thousands of mods uh, in the UK again and they were called, well it was called the Mod Revival but I mean it, it started in Essex like so many brilliant youth cultures um, and bands like the Purple Hearts, the Leapers, the Speedball and Secret Affair all came from Essex and spread throughout the country you know, Secret Affair sold 300,000 copies of their, uh, of their single Time for Action, which came out in 1979. I can't imagine. I think nowadays you've got to sell 10,000 to get to number one. So imagine selling 300,000 singles. There was a lot of mods, and a lot of kids liked the mod revival. And it lasted right up until Acid House in 1987. And I had a friend called Giles Peterson, who was a very successful radio DJ. And... Um, you know, we still like jazz and we still like funk and we still like soul and Latin and reggae and all the stuff that we liked before Acid House came, but no one was interested in it. So we just decided to <laughs> invent a version of Acid House for people who like jazz and soul and we called it Acid Jazz. And this kind of little scene became really popular, so we just followed it up with a record label and released records by our mates, basically. Mods and Scooters are kind of mutually important to each other. Mods used to use scooters to get around, to give themselves freedom. And every bank holiday, the mods would all go to the same seaside town. We would leave London on Friday morning, first thing in the morning. We'd drive to Brighton or to Hastings or to Great Yarmouth. Thousands of us. Word would get around, we'd all go to the same venue and we'd all park up, we'd get bed and breakfast, some people would camp, and there'd be thousands of scooters in this one town for the weekend. And uh, We'd have great fun. But, but for example, the Lambretta that you guys are rebuilding, um, we once went in convoy to the Isle of Wight scooter run, which is the main one every year. You get nine and a half thousand scooters. And the most amazing thing was uh, when we went in convoy around the whole of the Isle of Wight with another 9,000 scooters. People used to come out and look in the streets come out in their shops and go, what's that going past? And uh, it was a fantastic experience. And can you imagine driving along with 9,000 other bikes? It's like nothing I've ever experienced before. So, you know, we, we used to pack all that stuff on our backs. In my case, I take my records because I was DJing most weekends. And uh, we'd drive down to Brighton, where we would usually be attacked by skinheads. Uh, but those days are long gone. You don't see skinheads around anymore, but you still see plenty of mods. August Bank Holiday 1979 was the beginning of the skinhead wars. Uh, there had been about 1,500 of us had gone down to South End. Up to that point, mods and skinheads had got on quite well. Um, and there was no real trouble um, with skinheads. But they were a different youth cult that liked different music to us. And they were becoming increasingly political and increasingly right wing. And there was, I suppose, 1,500 people in South End walking up and down the seafront, driving the scooters, looking around. Suddenly, out of nowhere, about 300 skinheads came around the corner and just steamed into everybody with baseball bats and sticks. And there was a very big fight, lots of arrests, and the police came. And that was the beginning of what we call the skinhead wars, which lasted for about six years until skinheads just disappeared. Basically, skinheads were bigger than mods. They were always a couple of years older. Well, we were 15 years old. They were men at the time. And they just used to attack mods on site. And so it all started in South End in the August Bank holiday. But saying that, we had fantastic times in South End. That there was a really healthy mod scene there. There used to be lots and lots of nightclubs we used to go to. South End was one of the capitals of the Essex club scene and believe it or not looking at Essex now I know there is no club scene in Essex but in the 1970s and 1980s Essex was the capital of Britain when it came to nightclubs. People who ride scooters often experience trouble people tend to dislike don't know why 
because we've always thought it's really cool, but people tend to dislike people who ride scooters. And um, for example, the scooter you're rebuilding, um, you know, just from here, which is our office, the Acid Jazz headquarters, we drink in a pub around the corner called the Carpenter's Arms, which funnily enough used to belong to the Craytons. Anyway, so I was walking from the office to the pub when I saw Chris's Lambretta and it had been petrol bought. So that was heartbreaking. That's why you're rebuilding. Anything else? You're good, Jack? Yeah. You're done? Well done. Well done, guys. Good man. Nice one. Fantastic. Right. <coughs> Pause there. Back at the farm, the work on the scooter continued. This gave us time to think about what Eddie had said. He talked about the mod subculture and the links with Southend. To find out more, we thought we would visit Southend Museum. Today we are off to Southend to visit the Youth Culture Exhibition at the Beecroft Art Gallery. There we will interview Eleanor Farrell who put the exhibition together. Hopefully she will give us some information about the history of scooters and use in Southend. So my name is Iona Farrell and I work as Assistant Curator of Social History for Southend Museum Service and part of my job role was putting on this exhibition Subcultures which looks at youth cultures in Southend from 1950s to the present day. This exhibition looks at youth cultures in terms of fashion, music and lifestyles and everything in this exhibition has been known by South End people and all the stories on the wall are their memories and their experiences of being in youth cultures such as the punks, the mods, the rockers, teddy boys and we just have this fantastic um, vest for scooter. I think scooters are really important because it also gives people lots of freedom to move around especially for teenagers, so lots of people in youth cultures were teenagers um, so they kind of want to escape normal life, they want to have fun, so the scooter gave them the freedom to go where they wanted to. Um, so lots of people used to ride out on scooters along the South End Seafront and it creates this sense of identity if everyone has a scooter. Um, you're all together um, having this group identity and it's also loads of fun. So South End had a really thriving mob scene in the 1960s and it was really supported by the kind of coffee bar culture. So there were loads and loads of coffee bars around South End where people used to go to drink coffee and listen to music on jukeboxes. So we've got images of people around South End and Seafront in their scooters. But not just scooters, also motorbikes. So kind of the rivals of the mods um, were the rockers and they had motorbikes. That again was a sense of freedom. They used to do um, racing, going as fast as they could. Um, and there's a saying which is called doing the tongue, which is like going over 100 miles an hour on your motorbike. Um, although famously the mods and the rockers didn't used to like each other very much. South End, I think, because it's a seaside resort, lots of people seem to flock to the seaside in um, subcultures. So in the 1950s and 1960s there used to be lots of clashes on the seafront that the press used to make loads of stories about mods and rockers. And I think being at the seaside, being on the edge of everything, seems to attract people. Um, I always think the press loves to exaggerate things a lot. The press and newspapers loves to get a story and make it into a massive thing. So I think the mods and rockers did happen, but I think the press probably made it sound worse than it was. With the skinheads, um, there were clashes, but I think the press made them seem worse than they were. I think there's lots of negative stereotypes around skinheads, that maybe they're racist or they you know, they're hooligans, stuff like that. But that's only a small minority, like in any group, there's going to be those kind of people. So I put this exhibition together kind of using South End's community and working really closely with them. So it's actually thanks to them that this exhibition happened. And I think South End's always been a really creative place. Um, I think it's really testament to South End's creativity as a town, that it's always continuously kind of um, finding the newest thing, the most exciting thing and how music has always supported it. We've always had a strong music scene. Back on the farm as winter turned to spring, the Scooter project is progressing. We 
Reflecting on what Iona said at the Subcultures exhibition about the way the press may have exaggerated the story of clashes between the mods and the rockers, and the later skinhead wars that Eddie had talked about, we thought we would do more research into what actually happened, so we thought we'd visit the South End Archive. The newspaper archive at South End Library had little in the way of information about fights between the mods and rockers or the later skinhead wars. To find out what really happened, we needed to speak to someone who was there. Whilst looking through the archive, we came across an article written by a local resident that included a picture we've seen in the Subcultures exhibition of Morton South in the 1960s. We are heading to the Civic Centre in South to interview Councillor Brian Ayling. He was a mod in the 1960s and had a scooter much like the one we are rebuilding. Hopefully he will be able to give us some answers about what it was like back then. We showed Brian the photo we had found in the archive and seen in the subcultures exhibition. That's me just there. <laughs> you can just see my head, but I'd know my head anywhere. <laughs> That's my first scooter. Clean cut young lad there. That's on the back of my dad's scooter, because he had a scooter. And that's a friend of mine who we still meet each other. In fact, we live 50 yards away from each other. Oh, I think that was my first girlfriend on my scooter. And that was my Vespa 150. Oh, my name is Brian Ayling. I'm a local councillor for South End Borough Council. I've got children who say to me, Dad, we wish we'd been born in the 60s to experience it. It was generally a, a, a time of getting out and being active because we didn't have Xboxes or Playstations in those days. So we had to uh, fill our time with exercise and doing something. Uh, scooters gave us that ability to get out and about. We developed a thing called a coffee bar culture where we all gathered and met together because young people like to be in groups of people. So we gathered in one particular cafe, it was on the seafront, it was called The Shades and you've got pictures of us all together outside that period which was the so-called mod and, and the funny thing was that next door to the shades was a motorcycle group cafe. So you had the scooters here and the motorcycles there. But there were never any problems between us. It was a, it was a period of freedom, a period of us we were growing up. Uh, some of us had just started work, some of us were apprentices. It, it was young, it was vibrant. But I think the freedom was the most important thing at that time. I think the link was the, the freedom that the scooter gave you to travel. Um, I can remember being in, in, in the shades one night and you had a rumour that there was a party at a house in Hadley. Now, normally to get 20 people to a house in Hadley six, seven miles away, it would have been difficult. But of course, you've got a scooter and a passenger seat. So only needs 10 scooters to get 20 people to a house party. And, um, and they were good times. So the link was that ability to travel without a bus pass. <laughs> and uh, once again, the freedom that, that that ability to travel gave you. But that was why people had I mean, uh, regularly every weekend we'd either go down to Brighton, Clacton, Eastbourne. Once again, I mean, we went to Clacton one weekend. It was, I remember it was a bank holiday weekend. And there were probably 300 scooters all in a line in convoy going up to Clacton. A group of us went down to Brighton on our scooters and something went wrong with my bike, it crashed, I did a double somersault and came down on my head. Now, fortunately I got a crash helmet on but I ended up in hospital with concussion. 
if I hadn't got the helmet on, I'd be dead. I would have died. So the freedom that we had in the 60s was wonderful. Yes, scooters gave us the freedom. But there's still a lot of young people riding around on scooters and buying them. So I think in, uh, I hate to say, in 55 years, not a terrible lot has changed. Back at the farm, we were able to watch back and edit the footage of the interview with Brian. He talked about how the Morton Rockers got on and how there was no trouble between them. The archive we visited also held little evidence of major trouble. Eddie too talked about how the Morton skinheads got on for much of the time. It seems like most of these stories were exaggerated by the newspapers, making teenagers seem more dangerous and violent than they really were. This is something to be mindful of today, with many negative stories in the press about violent young people when the vast majority are not. As soon as the scooter were nearing completion, we thought we would try to find the location of Shades Cafe in South End. However, when we got there, where Councillor Ailing had said the cafe had been, it was now a block of flats. However, there is one part of South End 1960s mob culture that is still very much with us. Yeah, since 1966, which was a good year. Yeah, it was really, wasn't it? I suppose. Yeah. yeah, we used to go from you know the cafe bars, the mod ones. Obviously, there was a good few, a few in Lee, a few in South End. You know, all, all pretty local. The El Supremo. The El Supremo, yeah, that was the major one. Yeah. A mode of transport. Yeah, really, yeah, really, they were our mode. Of, yeah, they were our mode of transport because we had to go to work as well. It was a craze, it was a phase, you, you either went the motorcycle way or you went the mod way. And we preferred the, the mod, the, the better clothes, you know, you know, the nicer. And the music, we went with it. I mean, at that age, when you're 16, 17, I think you just go one way or the other. But you stick with it. Although in between, I have had motorcycles, same as Trevor has. Yeah, right, yeah. But uh, you just go back to what you, you like. Having hung out with Steve and Trev and talked to them about their scooters, we felt a link between the present and the past. This project has connected us today with local teenagers throughout the last 60 years. It has shown us things have not changed too much from the late 1950s. Just like the early mods in Essex, we like Italian fashion, music of black origin and of course scooters.